the theory and the history is all good, but in the end it comes at a cost, and the cost is always innocent people, children, pay the price. And in 1997, on September the 4th, my sister's little girl, Smadar, was killed in a, when two Palestinians blew themselves up in a suicide attack. What happened here is the first bomb blew up right in front of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, the VIP section, the first bomb. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on 21 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Most of our program will be a continuation of the talk by Miko Pellet at CCSU. Pellet has written The General Sun, a look, a look at the colonization of Palestine and modern developments from the point of view of a sympathetic son of an Israeli general. In the part of the talk we broadcast last week, Pellet talked about the history up until the conquest of the West Bank and Gaza. Today he continues and then gets very personal talking about the killing of his niece by a Palestinian suicide bomber. We also have a bit of Pellet in Ireland in April of this year at the grave of Irish Republican hero Bobby Sands appealing for the life of Palestinian hunger striker Samir Esawi. Then we go to video from Boston at the horrible bombing in Boston, Massachusetts. One of the people who was a hero at that uh, event was Carlos Arendando. He rushed in to help people who were terribly injured. And he was interviewed by a friend of his just minutes after the bombing, uh, Joan Livingston. We also have video from Anandana from years ago when he spoke at an anti-war rally in 2007. Arendando's son had been killed as a soldier in Iraq in 2004. And three years later, he was speaking against the war in Boston. We begin in New Britain, Connecticut. Miko Pellet is talking about the history of Palestine and Israel, and he had just been explaining that rather than be fearing Egypt in 1967, the generals around his father saw war with Egypt as a great opportunity. And I read everything that's been written about it. I wasn't expecting to find anything new. I just wanted to see it. But as soon as I began reading, I saw something that I had never read or seen anywhere before. And that was my father saying, and then the other generals repeating, that actually the Egyptian army, which is really the cause of it all, was not prepared for war. That the Egyptian army had needed at least a year and a half to two years before it's prepared for war, and therefore we need to attack because we have an opportunity. They're saying the fact that the Egyptians brought their army closer to us into Sinai makes it easier for us to destroy them once again, and we need to take that opportunity. Not a single word about a threat. Quite the opposite. And they say again and again, we can attack now, we can attack next month, we can attack whenever we want. We are going to be victorious because the Egyptian army is in shambles. But let's do it now, because it's better now. Well, what happened to the story about the existential threat? We were told that Israel was, and we're still told this, by the way. Still today, people say this, that Israel was under an existential threat. What happened to the threat? These are the generals. These are the people who are fighting the war, planning the war, in, in charge of intelligence and everything. Well, the campaign against the Egyptians, the, 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 the generals got the okay from the government, so they attacked the Egyptian army, destroyed it. It was a matter of days. They conquered the Sinai Peninsula. I'll go back to the map. They conquered the Sinai Peninsula. And then the generals, on their own, because there was already a momentum, decided they would take the West Bank, and attack Syria and get to take the Golan Heights. They did it for two reasons. One, their own ambitions. The general, the commanders of the, of the central and northern fronts wanted a piece of the action. And these were areas that they had wanted for many, many years. The generals saw taking the West Bank as what they call finishing the job. What job? 
the job of 1948 of conquering the land of Israel, of conquering Palestine. They were very unhappy that the Israeli government at the time decided not to take the West Bank. So for them, this was finishing the job. And they wanted the Golan Heights, strategically it's placed, there's lots of water and so on. And they did it. Now, if the Egyptian army wasn't prepared, the, the, the Jordanian and Syrian armies were certainly unprepared. The Egyptian army was really the only army of consequence uh, of all the Arab armies. And in six days, they destroyed three Arab armies. They killed 15,000 Arab soldiers at a loss of 700 Israeli soldiers. Now, every soldier is somebody's son, so you cry for everyone that dies. At the same time, the difference between 700 and 15,000 is striking. They tripled the size of the state of Israel, and they did all of this in six days. Now it makes sense. Now you understand how it was done. A well-prepared, well-trained army, well-motivated army attacks three, three countries that were ill-prepared and conquers land. There's nothing miraculous about this. And in reality, what they managed to do is this. They erased Palestine off the map completely, and Israel took over completely over the entire country. And this was their mission, and this is what they accomplished. Now, it's interesting because as soon as the, the land was conquered, the West Bank was conquered, they did exactly then what they did 20 years earlier with the, you know, after the War of 1948. Massive campaign of ethnic cleansing. Hundreds of thousands were forced into exile. Cities and towns and villages were destroyed. And massive building projects began for Israeli Jews only. Even though in the West Bank, the majority of the population was still Palestinian. This is exactly what Israel did after 48. They did the repeated exact same thing after 67 because it was the exact same mission. To conquer the land, get rid of the people, and build a state, the state of Israel in its place. So today, when people talk about the possibility of Israel allowing the Palestinians to establish a Palestinian state anywhere on that map, it's a complete misunderstanding. It's a complete misreading of what Israel is all about. It's an impossibility. And it goes against this very ideology that created the state of Israel. And, maybe more importantly, it goes against everything Israel has done over the last 65 years. The process of, of conquest, ethnic cleansing, and building for Israeli Jews only has been going on for 65 years, and it's still going on in all parts of the country. The West Bank is completely integrated into Israel, though you can't delineate it anymore. And now, there's another problem. This country, until the State of Israel was established, this country was an Arab country. For 1,500 years, it had an Arab history and culture and monuments, not to mention a language and so forth. So names are being changed, monuments are being destroyed. We already talked about cities and towns being destroyed. And a new history is being written. A history that connects today's Israel with King David, who may or may not have even existed. And there's the de-Arabizing is a very, a very important part of this. We talked earlier about the fact that they're building a, a museum of tolerance now in Jerusalem over an ancient um, cemetery, an ancient Muslim cemetery that goes back 1,200 years. So the cemetery is being destroyed, and a museum of what? Of tolerance is being built on top of it. But that's a small example. There are lots of examples. I'll give you another larger example. If you've been to the old city of Jerusalem, if you've seen the Wailing Wall, when you come out the gate, out the walls, you go down the hill, there's a community called Silwan. It's a community of 50,000 people. Okay, I live in a city that's 30,000 people in, you know, here in the US, in California. A community of 50,000 people. And someone said that under the homes of the Silwan is where the true city of David exists. Now, the past always trumps the present. So the homes of the people of Silwan are being destroyed. And a new park, an archaeological park called the City of David has been established. Tour buses are already there looking at it. You have these massive posters that show these really nice white Jewish kids playing around with ancient, you know, all kinds of archaeological artifacts. The homes 
of Silwan, the homes in the periphery are being destroyed because their foundations are being destroyed because of the digging. And in the larger periphery, Israeli settlers are taking over more homes. Hundreds have already taken over, which means they bring in a lot of military force because these people have stolen somebody's home. They're afraid for their lives. So there's a military force protecting the settlers. This is ethnic cleansing, destruction, and de-Arabizing all mixed in one in Jerusalem in broad daylight. Everybody can see it every single day, today, under our watch. And nobody says a word. Nobody says a word. Now, my father did something very interesting. He retired from the military a year after the war. And while, even before he retired, he stood up and he said, look, now that we've made all this, these conquests, we need to make peace with the Palestinians. Everybody thought he lost his mind. He said, look, we conquered all the land. We've established ourselves as a strong power. But the Palestinians are still here. We have to resolve the Palestinian problem, or else we're not going to be a democracy, because there will be a large Palestinian population within Israel, or we're going to be an, an occupying, uh, a brutal occupying power. We have to resolve it. And he was talking then, and those were the years where the two-state solution was being f formulated, really. The idea that a Palestinian state would be established in the West Bank and Gaza alongside Israel. He said, if we do this, we'll have a, they'll be the first Arab country to make peace with Israel, and then we can go on from there. But like I said, Israel did exactly the opposite. Massive ethnic cleansing, destruction, and building for Israeli Jews only in the West Bank. And they did it immediately. My father, after he retired, continued to pursue this path of peace. And in the mid-1970s, he and a group of other Israelis were contacted by the Palestine Liberation Organizations, by Yasser Arafat's main people, to begin a dialogue and to try to figure out how to bring about this two-state solution. This is Issam Sartawi, who was one of Yasser Arafat's aides. He was the Palestinian ambassador to Paris for many years. And um, it was interesting, because on the Palestinian side, these were official representatives of the Palestine Liberation Organization. On the Israeli side, there's people like my father who used to hold high position, but now they're really renegades. And whenever they would, would return, they would meet in either uh, Europe or North Africa. It was all in secret. My father would always come back and report to the prime minister. But the Israeli government would have nothing to do with it. Later on in the 80s, the Israeli Knesset, the, par the Israeli parliament, actually passed a law making these specific meetings illegal. They do that. They pass specific laws against specific people and groups. And then suddenly, in 1993, some of you may recall, the Oslo peace process began, and the Israeli prime minister, Rabin, and Arafat were on the White House lawn with President Clinton signing this Oslo accord. And you wonder, wow, what happened? What happened in 1993 that suddenly, in September, Rabin, or an Israeli prime minister, decided he was going to sign a peace agreement with the Palestinians. By 1993, Israel had made sure that the West Bank was completely integrated into Israel, that the conquest was irreversible, and that there was not a single chance that a Palestinian state could be established in the West Bank. That's when they agreed to begin negotiating with the Palestinians, but it wasn't for peace. It was for surrender. The purpose of the Oslo Peace Accords and all the peace process, if you can call it that, that took place, has been taking place ever since, and the reason it's not working is because it's an attempt to bring the Palestinians to complete surrender, and the Palestinians keep refusing. Then, in the year, my father died in 1995, and in his last interview, the, uh, one of the big Israeli papers did an interview with him before he died, and the headline was, Mati Pellet says Rabin doesn't want peace. In 1995, to say Rabin doesn't want peace, those of you who are old enough to remember, it's absurd because he was like, the Nobel Peace Prize and all these things were happening, and he shook the hand of Arafat. But my father and several others, by the way, read the Oslo Accords. And they opposed it because they said this is a surrender and it's not going to work. Then, in the year 2000, President Clinton decided to bring the parties to Camp David. So he brought another Israeli prime minister by then, Barak, and Yasser Arafat to Camp David, and they were going to close the deal. And the negotiations went on, days after days after days, and another day, and another day. Finally, they came out, and what did Bill Clinton say? He said, well, 
The Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. In other words, he was blaming the Palestinians for what? For not making concessions. Let's take a look at the map for a second, okay? By agreeing to the two-state solution, by agreeing to having a state in the West Bank and Gaza, Palestinians gave up 80% of their homeland. They gave up 80% of Palestine for peace. And also, they gave up the right of the refugees to have a return to their homes. So they're not willing to make concessions? They made a major, the major concession. And they recognized a state that destroyed their own country and forced them into exile. And all this for peace. And the claim that was being made as well, Arafat wasn't willing to make concessions. He wasn't willing to surrender. He wasn't willing to do anything less than this, which is what, he was, what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to agree to much, much, much less than this. Little points within the West Bank that would have some limited Palestinian autonomy. And to that, of course, he refused. He was vilified. And then he died in his office with Israeli tanks surrounding him as some of you may recall, four years later. Now, this has a cost. You know, the theory and the history is all good, but in the end it comes at a cost, and the cost is always innocent people, children, pay the price. And in 1997, on September the 4th, my sister's little girl, Smadar, was killed in a, when two Palestinians blew themselves up in a suicide attack. So how do you wrap your head around something like that? A 13-year-old girl dies just like that, walking down the street one day. I was already living here in the US. I took the first plane home. When I got to Jerusalem, my sister's apartment was already filled with reporters. You know, the front page was already talking about the granddaughter of General Pellet. She was the granddaughter of a famous general, so this was big news, even bigger than normal, than usually things like this are. But not only was he a famous general, he was also famous for, you know, preaching for peace with the Palestinians. And now look what they did to him. When finally, after the funeral, my sister came out to talk to everyone, she was asked, of course, about retaliation and about revenge and about how we would deal with the people who are responsible and all this. And she said something very simple that really helped me wrap my head around it. She said, first of all, in terms of revenge, she said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. The notion of killing in response to killing. And of course, motherhood being a uniting factor that goes through everything, really, above everything. And then she said, who's responsible? Let's talk about who's responsible. She said, well, these two young men were brought to such a level of hopelessness that they took their own lives and the lives of other innocent civilians, including my 13-year-old daughter. But what brought them to this level of hopelessness? She said, it was we, the Israelis, the occupation, the oppression. When you take away people's homes, when you destroy their homes, when you throw their fathers and older brothers in jail for, for countless years, when you shoot their younger brothers and sisters in their schools, when you deprive them of water, of travel, of any rights whatsoever, of any hope whatsoever, this is what happens. And she said, I hold the Israeli government directly responsible for my daughter's death. So now this bereaved Israeli mother has taken everything and turned it upside down. Because what do we know to be true? We know that the Palestinians are terrorists, the Israelis are victims, the Israelis want peace, the Palestinians want destruction. And now here comes this bereaved Israeli mother and turning everything upside down. And like you heard, she became active. Her husband, Rami, my brother-in-law became active. And this has become something my family is, is, is doing now uh, all the time. What I did was I had to come back to the US. I had a job. I had a business. I had a family. And you, how, do you go back to, how do you go back to work? Let me tell you, when you carry a coffin of a 13-year-old girl to its grave, that it's not something you can go back to work the next day. But you have to. And I was very fortunate that in San Diego, I was able to participate in a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group. And I was born and raised in Jerusalem, 
which is supposedly a mixed city, but this was the first time here in the U.S. that I actually met Palestinians. Because Jerusalem, even though it's mixed, it's completely segregated. It's a completely racist city. So I was here in San Diego, I was in San Diego at the time, in a room with Palestinians, just sitting and talking like, you know, normal people for the first time in my life. But not only that, this was the first time I was around Palestinians and we were completely equal. They did not have to go through a checkpoint. They did not need a special permit. The laws that govern me govern them exactly the same. That doesn't exist over there. That does not exist over there at all. There was no curfew they had to meet, nothing. We would talk, we would eat, we'd go home, that was it. And for a lot of, a lot of Israelis and other Jewish people would come to these meetings and they couldn't take it. They would rush out and say to me, how, do you, how can you sit with these extremists? So what extremists? These are people that are trying to figure this out just like I am. If they were extremists, they wouldn't be here. And very uh, generously and, grac and, 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 and graciously, they took me by the hand from this place from which I came into Palestine, which was really next door to me, but I never saw it. And introduced me to Palestine as a place, to Palestinians as a people, and to the Palestinian narrative, which of course was diametrically opposed to my narrative, to what I knew, particularly on the issue of 1948. Now Peled's remarks in Ireland on April 12th. And this is the, these are the last two paragraphs of his article. And he's calling on Israelis and he says, do not listen to those generals and those dusty myths for the defeated will not remain defeated and the victor will not remain a victor. It, history isn't only measured by battles, massacres and prisons, but by peace with the other and the self. And this is written and this is being said by a man who is uh, willingly dying for freedom. And, and unwilling to, uh, to compromise his freedom and his independence. Carlos Arredondo, the man in the cowboy hat, bravely rushed to help the injured after the Boston bombing. Here he is in an interview. It's, it's a marathon day in Boston at Copley Square, and very unexpectedly, two bombs went off. And with us, we have two friends, Carlos and Melita Arredondo, who were actually at the site when the bomb went off. Maybe Carlos, who's obviously got blood on himself from helping the victims, he can tell us what he saw, where he was, and what happened, what this blood is all about. Well, you know, unfortunately for, for all of us, you know, this thing happened right in front of us, and, and this is... This is a tragedy, you know, that we're going to pretty much remember forever. And what happened here is the first bomb blew up right in front of the of the of the of the, of the, of the, the VIP section. The first bomb went VIP off. Yeah, yeah, few jars before the end of, of, of the marathon. The first bomb blew up and pretty much ripped a lot of people's legs off. Well, this, all these people was standing in the sidewalk when this bridge blew up. And and when this when this bomb blew up, pretty much took off and these thirty people right there, right. and limbs and arms and everything was off. And then a second bomb, just a few seconds later, blew up. In 2007, Arredondo and his wife Melinda appeared at an anti-war rally in Boston at the depths of the Iraq war. My name is Melida Arredondo, and I am a gold star stepmother. This is my husband, Carlos. He's holding up a sign that says, we are hope in Spanish. What is a gold star stepmom? When you, as a parent or a family member, lose your loved one at war, you get this little gold star issued by an act of Congress in 1947. I am a gold star step parent. Okay. <sighs> Alex was killed at the age of 20 years and 20 days. I have to apologize to you all. 
I am one of four Gold Star parents in New England who have been speaking out against the war. My husband and Joyce and Kevin Lucy are the other three. Why are we so few? Perhaps some of us have a recent loss. This is too new to us to actually speak out. Perhaps we're too conflicted about whether we should speak out or not. Or perhaps there are those out there who are so full of hate, they tell us that by speaking for peace, we are traitors. In Massachusetts, there have been 86 who have been killed in action in Iraq. Two have committed suicide and one is missing in action. On top of that, there are 12 who have been killed in action in Afghanistan. Alex was called Dondo by the Marines, band of brother who stood and fought with him. Alex wrote his family and friends many letters. From boot camp, Paris Island, he wanted to let everybody know that I love them. All milita military and families and troops know that getting mail is the best feeling you could ever have. Alex wrote, I can't wait to hear from you again. In 2002, he wrote us about his rock mate, Jason Poindexter, the laziest person I ever met, he joked. They went through basic training together at Paris Island. He wrote that letter on his father's birthday in 2002. Two years later, on that date in 2004, Alex would be killed by a sniper's bullet, shot to the left temple. Poindexter was killed 18 late, days later in 2004. So I say to you, Dondo, my Alex, I am forever faithful, semper fidelis, siempre fiel, and I hope that my words honor you always. God bless you all. Peace to all. Thank you. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle.